As we open the stage for the exciting second round, I would like to quote a phrase. It's not just about ideas. It's about making ideas happen. And to make ideas happen, to grow, to turn every dream into a reality, one of the key ingredients is fun. Today, we have with us a few illustrious entrepreneurs from our very own land of Gujarat who have successfully leveraged private equity investments for their growth. I invite Mr. Vishal Mehta and Mr. Kamlesh Gandhi on the stage to share with us their experience with their investors. Mr. Vishal Mehta, with an experience of 14 plus years in the field of e-commerce, is the founder and MD of Infibeam Incorporation Limited. Infibeam operates in a distinct business model of e-commerce, which is a combination of integrated services and products achieved through an array of B2B and B2C enterprise solutions. Can I please invite Mr. Vishal Mehta to take over the podium and uh, address? Sure. Thanks. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, and you know it's a pleasure to be here. I see a lot of entrepreneurs. I used to be one of them, and I'm still one. Uh, you know, I was just on the other side of the podium before, you know, 10 years ago, uh, and I would love to share a little bit about my experiences. I'm told that I need to share my experiences about how to manage investors. Uh, you know, I've got a few investors also in the crowd, uh, which is great because you know I'll talk from the gut, okay, and I'll tell you exactly what we do and how we do things, and you know the experiences of. You know, what are some of the challenges that we faced, you know, as a company I faced as an entrepreneur. Uh, and I think you know, hopefully I'll be able to make it in time. Okay. So, um, you know, the biggest thing that is important, and I think, you know, uh, I go by that philosophy, that one needs to just think about execution first and not optics. Uh, a lot of our entrepreneurs, you know, the early, early days and even 10 years ago when I started this company, uh, the, <clears throat> there's this uh, mental model, you know, how do I get recognized fast? You know, what you've done as an entrepreneur is that you've let go a lot of your, you know, stable income business, you know, uh, you know, uh, employment salaries, uh, and there's already a lot of pressure from the families saying, you know, Kya kar rahe ho? are you doing the right thing or are you not doing the right thing? Are you going to survive? Are you not going to survive? Have you made the right decision? And what tends to happen to an entrepreneur is that, you know, uh, somewhere in the past you had some status, you had an image, you knew that you had a stable job, your wife married you because of that, okay? And <laughs> finally what ends up happening is that you've lost all of that, okay? And, uh, you know, then you go and say, okay, okay, you know, what's my status now? You know, uh, how do I get recognized? People go into this mode of stealth mode, okay? I'm in a stealth mode, at least there is some recognition there. But unfortunately, there is no stealth mode that will last for a long time. And then you go and say, okay, how do I actually make it work, right? And then you start focusing on the things which are more around the optics, okay? Which is that, you know, okay, how do I actually go and, you know, be out there, okay? And at least, you know, let people recognize what we are doing as a company. And in that process, I mean, everyone goes through this, okay? I mean, literally every single individual goes through this. And, uh, you know, what ends up happening later in life is that you start realizing that, hey, listen, guess what? Um, you know, uh, money is equal to oxygen. I saw a great panel over here who were talking about, you know, who would we invest in and how would we invest and why would we invest. And I think the biggest thing that, you know, at least for me, that I think worked for me was two things. One is that, you know, you have to show your energy and passion about what you do. I mean, and, and it just is contagious. It will show up if you're really you know, uh, energized and if you believe that it will work for you, it will work for you. And I think that, you know, any investor will perhaps look into, you know, that energy and that passion that comes across as any entrepreneur saying, hey, listen, yes, this guy's committed. Any problem that comes up, this guy will solve the problem. Okay. Problem solve karta hai. Yani, I think, you know, there is a, there is a, a method to madness and I know that, you know, he'll not get frustrated. He's impatient. He'll not get frustrated. He will continue doing what he's doing and he'll make it work. Okay. So I think that that works. Okay. And then the second thing which is also important is that um, a lot of <clears throat> entrepreneurs go through this phase uh, because money is equal to oxygen that, hey, listen, let me actually say things that the investor wants to hear, okay? And, and I think that, you know, that's where the fallacy lies. I, I think that it's important to listen to what people have to say and to learn to actually put your points across so that, you know, you make them understand about what your business is all about. 
but it's not important enough to actually go back and change your tone and change your pitch and make sure that you know you're actually making it work for them you know it's hard enough to build a business it's hard enough to actually go back and make it work for you why would you want to make it work for someone i mean it doesn't make sense at least in the startup phase at least in the initial phase of life it just makes it so hard because now you are actually living a life you don't want to live and that's when you know this things percolate into the situations and then the same conversations also has to happen with the employees so in our company employees are big investors okay and and while we've got investors in real estate enterprise we've got employees also who are very large investors into us and you know for me what worked was to actually be very transparent direct and communicate okay so in other words uh, there is a lot of um, you know talk when i started this company 10 years ago about what is e-commerce you know there's so much capital coming in into this business there is so much energy into this business and one thing i knew for sure okay when i started this 10 years ago in 2007 and in 2 years i was able to figure it out that the best human capital which is out there in this country was moving into this sector so in other words forget everything else but the moment you start realizing that people who are so smart okay across the country they are moving in into this sector this sector has to survive it has to do well there is no other way out right because you start realizing that you know this is not something where it's a flash of brilliance it is not something where you go and think that hey listen it will survive jada badega nahi badega this is going to be there and it is going to be there for real because there are too many smart people who want to make things work all right so as a company we said that you know what are we doing and we uh, work in this e-commerce space where there's so much you know uh, competition and that there's so many things that are happening by the day that we said that there are three main things if you look at you know bear it down to the basics there are three things that we have to solve as a company either you solve something in demand you solve something in supply or you solve something in capacity there's no third or fourth you know thing to solve okay so in other words you have a business and you know in a business you're going to use technology to solve these three things potentially so a lot of companies said i am demand i just want to be demand nobody has to worry about anyone else just come to me everything will work for you you don't have to go to anyone else okay and that's where you actually go and spend this capital to be able to go and get everybody the mind share the communication everybody has to think of only me nobody else it happens right to some of you maybe possibly so so we went back and said that you know listen that very hard you know i don't have that oxygen that money to be able to go back and think through it and and you know we said that you know our culture is not that our culture is make it sustainable sustainability is equal to profitability okay so there's no other alternative to this you forward invest but you have to be sustainable you have to think about it you have to think long term and say that is this going to be profitable so we said that's one <clears throat> we actually talked to a lot of investors they didn't like it they said no growth is more important right because you know they're you know there's a different parameter for each of the investors and we went back and said should we actually now focus on growth this is very interesting there's lots of money the pots of money out there you know so in other words people say that you know listen i like need to like in i heard the podium you need to like the promoter you need to like the team second is do i understand their business model and third is you know how will it scale right i mean in other words those are the two three things that they look into and everyone said that growth is the only thing that you have to look after because it's you know um, but the gold rush that everyone has to go after it and that the more you dig the more you get the more you will actually benefit and that there's so much capital available and for us we went back and we said that you know listen we've seen this happen and that you need huge access to capital and will that be the right thing for us in you know, this is our culture you know as a company and and you know the purpose with which we started this company out and went back and said that no this is not it you know we're going to stick to what we think is right we think that it's okay you know we are not alternative to growth and profitability that we will forward invest but we need to make sure that it is sustainable okay because sustainability is equal to profitability in the long term and we will not compromise growth so we said in that demand supply and capacity framework in the demand side we want to enable demand we don't want to be saying that you know we are the only place where we have to come where anyone has to come and so today we power a lot of stores thousands of stores in the demand generation space the likes of high design crossword gvk airports lots of theme parks in this country we've actually given it out to international companies as well we give it to jumbo electronics axiom telecom to name a few eros things like saudi telecom we just recently signed up sears it took us 10 years okay 
And for 10 years, a lot of companies went back and said, and even investors, they said, you're the website banate. You got it? It's easy, right? I went back and said, your website banate, website mein theek hai, you know, ye achhe karte hai. website is better than everyone else's, and so as a result, people come to them. And internally, we went back and said, you know, do we shout at the top of our lungs and communicate to them and say, no, you know, we're more than that. Or we go and say, you know, let's just execute, right? And eventually, optics will prove itself. And so we went back and we took that philosophy and we said that, you know, we have to listen, by the way. Huh? This is the best thing we've done, by the way, in the history of our company. We go to investors, we listen to what they have to say. You don't have to push an agenda. Literally, there's no agenda. They will make you smarter. They're very critical about you. They will make you so smart about how to think you through your business. And then for those people who never came in into us at that point, I made it a point that after 12 months, not after two months, not after six months, after 12 months, I went back to them and said, why did you not put in money into my company? Because what tends to happen is that there are so many relationships and so many conversations that you've been having in parallel with them. And they will tell you when you're listening, but you also have an agenda and you've got certain deadlines to follow and you've got certain choices to make. And what tends to happen at the very end of this whole spectrum is that they will tell you, maybe you want to listen, you did not hear it properly back then. But after 12 months, when you go and say, why did you not invest? Has anyone done that here? I think it's a very important thing, seriously. It's a, a, you know, the, the fact of life is the realizations only come because you actually go and ask that question and say, why? And then after 12 months, you will be a different listener and they will be a different talker. And then you'll start realizing that, hey, listen, these are the problems. These are the places where you actually did something wrong that you could correct yourself and that you could actually make a difference. So um, I think if you repeat the same process while we actually went through an IPO process as well, it's about 12 months. So I think, you know, it's time that, you know, I actually go and start talking to some people as well. But the fact is that that is a very important aspect of, you know, being able to go and figure out how to make it better. Number two, you actually go and figure out that, hey, listen, I can't shout. I will go perform in the demand side, and I will try to make it better and better. So we did that. And then there is an accident that happens. And I'll tell you what that accident is. For any business, there is accidents that happen. It's great accidents, OK? Fantastic things that happen to you that people start teaching you. And then they, you realize that, hey, listen, this is very interesting. It'll work for me. OK, I'll tell you what it is. There are brands, okay? So there are retailers that we were following and saying, demand pay focus karo, because we can't solve all the three things together. So we said capacity, TK, you know, I, capacity, by the way, to in our languages, warehousing, logistics, data centers, that kind of capacity, okay, that I can solve. But we said that, you know, suppliers are very important. So we went after those who were suppliers, okay? And there were large brands like the Panasonics of the world and the Apples of the world and recently even Amul as a matter of fact. And we said that, you know, these brands are very important, but this is a very interesting problem that one brand came to us and talked about. They said, I've got 200 products, but only 25 products make up 80% of my revenues. Anyone who has a brand who will perhaps think about it that way, maybe not all, okay? But a lot of brands do that. They've got 200 different products that they can give to the market, <clears throat> but 20% of the products make up 80% of the revenues. So the remainder 80% of the products is very important, by the way. The portfolio is very important, but they never get connected to the end users. And the distribution channel of that brand never carry that product because they don't move very fast. It's like holy cost and margins, right? Because I've got limited capital. So if you actually go, and even in certain cases, you'll find and go to a store and you won't find bread, which is very important. Okay, because the other ones are even slightly more aggressive in that they move much faster. So we went back and said, hey, this is very beautiful. So the life in the journey of an entrepreneur is to wait and to aggressively solicit both these accidents. Okay, so we went back and said, this is great. Now, <clears throat> I will get a brand, I will bring that whole distribution channel online, and I will open up B2B opportunities so that there is a reactive buying of all these 80% of the products. I'm going to help the brand sell 80% of the products because that 20% is already sold. The 80% is where the problem is. And we went back and said, if we do it for one, we can do it for many. So we started up picking up the supply, and that means they're building up this whole ERP infrastructure as well in terms of being able to address that problem and giving it out to brands. And so we did that <coughs> and said that, okay, this is demand and this is supply, and if we can do this in India, we can do it anywhere else. Okay? Because this is not limited to India. 
Digital does not have boundaries. We don't have to work like an oracle giving you a database and saying you do whatever you want. That we go and say we will co-own it, we will make sure that we can learn for you, we will actually make it work for you, we will address your concerns and we'll make it better. That's what we did in the demand and supply side. And then the capacity side, we said that you know the two things that are interesting problems to solve in India is data center because transactions have to terminate on a particular machine where there is a buyer meeting the seller. No? Taxation happens that way. I mean, the cloud does not mean that transactions have to terminate on a cloud. They have to terminate on a machine, and that machine can be anywhere. And if you bring that machine in India, it's even better. No? Because a lot of companies, even internationally, they go back and start thinking that if I do the termination of transactions in Saudi Arabia, then I'll give you this tax benefit. You know, I mean, we, are, we are still waiting for our tax benefits. We don't have one, but the whole point is that, you know, it's a, bit, it's, a, it's a good bet to make. And we said that, you know, listen, that's important. It's an interesting problem. You know, cloud's interesting. We can do so many things in capacity. Let us go back and work on these things. So what I was trying to tell you is that, you know, as an entrepreneur, this opportunity evolves. The evolution of that opportunity is very important. You know, if you start thinking about it from a vision standpoint and saying that, you know, listen, I want to do all the three. I want to solve demand. I want to solve supply. I want to solve it's very, very hard. So in other words, I personally believe the best way to do it is do what is necessary first. Okay? That's how it starts. Because as any entrepreneur, you have to do what is necessary. What problem am I solving? What is necessary to solve this problem? Okay? It's almost like, you know, how many people have changed homes? Maybe some of you, right? So you actually go into a home and say, okay, what is necessary to live in that home? So that's the first part. Eventually, you solve what is possible. Because then you go back and say, okay, I can live properly. I need to now start having a, maybe an air conditioner and a television and all of these things are possible and I can make it work within the constraints and means that I have. And I promise you that, that the moment you start what is possible and solve it, you will be solving the impossible. Because it just naturally, you don't realize it, but you're actually solving the impossible. And it's intuitive. I think in a lot of people, and I've got entrepreneurs as well, like Darshan Bhai and many others, they'll perhaps share that same experiences as well. But the fact is that you, technically, when you scale up, you are really solving the impossible in some way, shape, or form. For your customers, for your clients, for your stakeholders, for your employees, not realizing that you're doing it. You don't start out by solving what is impossible. It's very hard. And I think you know, that's where the frustration comes in. That's where the impatience comes in. That's when it becomes harder by the day. And that's when you start realizing and saying that, you know, listen, how do I do it? So we went back and we, uh, you know, consummated, we actually debated about whether we were a private company, a public company, and there were some discussions about, you know, how to think through it. And I'll spend a couple of minutes to actually talk about that. Um, you see, when you are a private company, and when you are a company where you even have private equity investors, or even venture capital investors, that typically whatever happens, happens within the four walls. Okay? So whatever issues are discussed, whatever problems that you face, whatever things that you want to evolve into, that, that happens within the four walls of the, of the company. Okay? The moment you actually become public that you, know, you essentially have a transparency, there's a lot more accountability, there's a lot more discussion, there are a lot more opinions about people who have invested into you that you would actually have to listen to and address. And even an uh, investor who is actually having a single share is as important as someone who's got you know, maybe a few thousand. So that's the importance and that's the accountability that one takes up when you actually go back and a public company. That's one. Okay? We made a conscious choice and we went back and said that you know, it's good because it will bring good governance, good transparencies, good opportunities, uh, you know, being able to go back and figure out how to grow faster and better. So we went through that, you know, a lot of discussions, debates about you know, what is it that is required. Uh, given the sector that we work in, which has got a lot of visibility, and that there's billions of dollars being spent in that sector, that we said, you know, in demand and supply mode, we know we can generate capital and money and returns for our shareholders because it's profitable. We've invested in this 10 years ago. In the capacity side, we will invest more in logistics as well as data centers to make it better. And that we can keep that opportunity out to many, not just one. So I think that that, that is a very healthy debate to have. And that, you know, that uh, are you actually capable? Are, have you, you know, got the right set of people who can actually help you uh, get there? And that you can keep on focusing on the right allocation of capital in the right places so that you can generate the right return on investment to your you know, stakeholders. So I think, you know, the, the entrepreneur I'll tell you is you never start a company thinking I'll take this company IPO. I never started that. No company starts that way. Every company starts saying I want to solve a problem. Okay. 
And in that evolution, you have good people who come to you and say, hey, listen, these are the things that you can potentially work on that will increase shareholder value. You can actually increase you know, your market capitalization. You can actually work on those right set of parameters that will help you in the long term. And that you will keep on working on those and you listen to what people have to say and it gets better and better by the day. Very recently, I'll tell you, we've actually looked at you know, utilizing because the sources of capital also grow as we actually you know, become more and more visible, and that it happens to any company as a matter of fact. But I think you know, the core principles keep on staying the same. Focus on execution, not optics. You keep on doing that, it will work for you. That's the only advice that I can give you, you know, sitting where I'm sitting. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Vishal, for your perceptive words on entrepreneurship and your, about your approach towards the investors as well. I would now invite Mr. Kamlesh Gandhi to share his unique experiences with his investors. Mr. Kamlesh Gandhi, with an experience of 25 plus years in retail financial services industry, is the founder and CMD of Mass Financials, uh, a systematically important non-deposit taking NBFC, engaged in specialized retail lending. It has attracted an investment of 180 cr plus crore rupees. Over to you, Mr. Gandhi. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen in the audience. <coughs> So when entrepreneurs speak, it is no more a technical session, it's a practical session, I think. <laughs> so I'll be sharing our experience on how we raised the capital and how we could realize the objective. I'm very happy to be here among you, especially because capital raising is a very important event in the life cycle of any business and it, and it has a very lasting impact. So. When we raise the capital, I will say how we raise the capital, how much amount we raised, and how we do our business is very subjective. I think I will add value by telling, the, by sharing with you that what were, what was the approach we followed, and what was our understanding every time when we raised the capital, so that we could realize our objective of leveraging on capital, balancing between growth, ownership and control, generating decent returns on equity that which affects the valuation of any company, maintaining operational independence at the same time getting strategic input from the investors from time to time, and overall maintaining excellent working relationships with all the existing and the past investors. When we raised the first capital way back in 2006, we were approximately sub-100 crores. And subsequently, we raised four rounds of capital. And as I talk to you now, we have asset under management of close to 3,000 crores. Now, I'd like to share with you that every time when we raise the capital, we followed an approach to realize our objective. The first and the foremost, what I'd like to share with you is raise capital if needed, no, but not because it is available. That is very important. Nowadays you see so much of capital available, but the first thing you need to ask is whether I need the capital or not. Because capital is the costliest component on your liability. If you raise the capital in the right amount and at the right time, it will enable you to generate good return on capital, the way you employ the capital, so good return on equities, thereby affecting your valuations. And at the same time, you should have the confidence that capital chases sustainable and scalable business model. You'll always get the capital if you have a scalable and a sustainable business model. So we followed this approach. And when we talk about experience, it is all about what mistakes we made during this journey. So if I share with you, we had four rounds of capital raised after the first round. And I must admit that one of the round was raised in quick succession, which in hindsight, I believe that I would have done away with. So it is very important that you raise the capital at the right time and in the right amount. That will enhance the value of your business enterprise. The second thing what you need to be very clear is about your objective. That growth, ownership, and control has to be balanced. It is like that you can't eat the cake and keep it too. 
If you want to grow very fast, you have to raise capital every year or you have to raise capital very frequently to fuel your growth. If you have this objective, you should be ready to seed control, seed ownership in the medium to long term. So you need to understand that growth, ownership and control needs a balance. It's all about your objective. So there are no right views, wrong views. It is all about your views. So if you have the view that I want to grow, irrespective of what dilution I have to make, you can take that decision. But if you are circumspect, that no, I want to have a balanced approach on growth, ownership, and control, then you have to take your decisions accordingly. So this is, we did, this is what we did at Mass. That, as I told you, when we raised our first capital, we were 100 crores. Where when we got a substantial capital from Development Bank of Netherlands, that is FMO, $10 million investment in 2008, we are close to around, say, 175 crores. And every time we took the capital, we are very clear in our objective that we want a balance between growth, ownership, and control. And that is how we structured getting the capital from our investors. So th this is very important that you are very clear in your objective. So we had a very absorbing session in the morning about how investors should think, what are the questions that investors should ask, what about the exit of the investors, what about the value creation for the investors. I will replace investors by entrepreneurs here. You need to ask some right questions to yourself and to the investors before taking capital. And I will also like to add here the power of entrepreneurs along with P for running SME enterprises. It's very important. It's not only about the power of P. In fact, it is the power of entrepreneur which runs the capital. No offense, capital is a very important enabler to realize your objective. But I studied in 11 standard that it is entrepreneur who controls land, labor, and capital. So when this E is replaced by C, things doesn't turn out the way it should be. So when we talk about uh, not sufficient exits being provided, having not very good experiences, we have to visit the fundamentals. So the right questions, what you have to ask, in terms of valuing your company, and before you can ask the right questions, you need to have the right understanding that how a company is valued. See, it's all about risk-reward mechanism. You need to understand that at what stage of the business cycle are you raising the capital? What is the industry scenario of your business? What are the future growth prospects of your business? And this should help you to understand the risk reward mechanism and hence the valuation. So it's very important that you understand your businesses correctly and ask the right questions to yourself and put forth the same to the investor in order to get the optimum valuations whenever you raise the capital. And it, it is very imperative that you know the business yourself and if you have the confidence in you, your confidence will definitely rub on to the investors. So this is very important understanding what we always used to have when we went for the valuing the company, that what are the risks and how are the rewards. And let me tell you, this is a very difficult thing. The general practice among investors is that they will like to have unlimited risk and hence unlimited returns. This is, this is the usual practice which the investors want. They follow rather. Now when we raise the capital, when we raised our first capital, we were already a decade old company. We, st uh, we started in 1995 as a corporate enterprise. And the first capital we raised was in 2006. So we knew that what are the risks involved in the business and hence the reward has to be designed accordingly. And whenever I used to talk to various investors, I used to tell them that I can't bring in more risk in the business because of the business I am in, because of the experience what I have about this business. And hence, it will not be possible for you to reward indefinitely as far as the rewards are concerned. So you need to be very assertive on what you understand, and that will uh, get you the right valuations. The very important thing what uh, I think uh, the earlier speaker already focused upon that is 
the belief in your business model. When you talk to an investor for two hours, they will analyze your business, they'll be in your organization for a couple of days, and soon you will find giving them, giving you some suggestions, very useful sometimes, and sometimes very difficult to understand. So, so don't change your business model to uh, say we are into financial services industry and rating makes a lot of difference to how we raise funds. And we work with uh, many of the uh, smaller MFIs and smaller NBFCs in the country. And we don't only fund them, we are their advisors also. So you always tell them that don't change your business model only because to please the investor and the rating agencies. You can go terribly wrong. I just give an example that a standard risk factor for any rating agency when they rate a financial service industry is geographical risk concentration. Now they say that, now they will start rating, rating a 100 crore company and they will tell that you are only present in one state. So we, we think that this is a very high geographical uh, concentration and hence high risk. But practically spreading in too many states at 100 crores is more risk than the ones he is taking right now. So it is very important for you to understand your business model and take the decisions accordingly and don't take the decisions to please the investors or the rating agencies because it doesn't work in the interest of the enterprise. So the experience what you will have with the investors is the function of your understanding and the function of your transparency at the time of taking the investment. If you have the right objectives at place, if you understand that these are the objectives I'm here to realize, if you, if you think that this is, this is what I want, this is what I never want to do, it has to be very clear at the time of taking the investment and then you will have wonderful experience. See, there is no magic signs in this that you will have always a bad experience or a good experience. There is always a logic to it that if you are very clear, very transparent in what you want while taking the investment, that will always help you. And let me tell you that your job is to concentrate on how you can efficiently manage your business unit and cons consistently enhance the shareholders value. You cannot focus on the exit mechanisms. You cannot focus on what X the investor will make. This is up to the investor's analysis and discretion as to what he will make. If you are working the way you have promised, if you are adding to the efficiency, if you have the operational excellence, that is bound that is bound to follow. So you have to believe in your business model, you have to understand the fundamentals, and if you have this right approach while taking the investment, I think you will have a wonderful in experience with the investors. Because I'm, very I'm, I'm pretty sure that after the first session, so many out of you would be a confused lot that whether I should go for the investment or these are, uh, the, the, if this is, the, this is the way they do exit, they will, very, they will very plainly tell that, okay, we will do an exit by strategic sellout. We can sell out to the competitor in a distressed situation. See, the relationship between the entrepreneur and the investor is such, or the situation between the entrepreneur and the investor is such, that investor is running for his food whereas entrepreneur is running for his life. Hmm? It's, this is very important to understand, that when you start an enterprise, you have given everything what you have to this enterprise. So you are, give, you are, you are putting everything, so you are running for your life, whereas an enter, the investor is running for his food. So his intensity towards your business will differ. And this is what we need to understand. So in order to make it simple, in order to make it simple, if you have the right approach and understanding, and if you stick to it, you will get the investment the way you want it. And this is what we have experienced at Mass. Having faced uh, various uh, private equity investors over this five round of capital raise, 
Uh, one thing I'll advise you is that identify the disconnect with the investor very early. If during the due diligence process you find that okay, these are not the questions I would have, he or she should have asked me. This is not the way it was. It would have been dealt with. You can agree to disagree. Don't think that this is the initial phase, and later on it will settle. There are chances later on it can go worse. So if you have disconnected the initial stage, please identify it very early. Because they have, they see, they are, they are into. I, I have, I have no complaints against it. But you have to be very patient while raising uh, pro capital from the investors, because it is not only the business model questions you have to answer. You have to answer so many other things as to whether you have a you have a chauffeur or you drive yourself. How far do you live from your office? How do you spend your day? Uh, how many club memberships do you have? They are the compulsions. They need to know you as a person. So any disconnect at the beginning of the investment has to be taken very seriously. So in short, if you have the right sort of understanding, raising capital will be easy. Please don't get afraid and scared by all the technical things what they talk about. At the end of the day, it's all about your performance. And I think that it is the power of entrepreneurs which runs the business, agreeing to the fact that capital is a very, very important enabler to realize your objective. As an entrepreneur, I would, I have some expectations from investors. The first and the foremost expectation is that the investor should be your friend, philosopher, and guide in terms of the finance, or on the finance part of your business. Because I always, I always realized that we are into financial services, we know the nitty gritties of finance. There are so many other entrepreneurs, maybe somebody in engineering, somebody in some other industry, in trading or services, they might be very good at their business, might not be very good at finance. So the first and the foremost duty of the investor is to give them the right advice as far as the financial aspect of the business is concerned. That will build up the relationships. And if you have relationships, you can do number of transaction. If you have a transaction oriented motive, you will have only few transactions. But if you have a relationship oriented motive, you can have number of transaction. So this is my expectation from investor that they should act as your friend, philosopher, and guide. And they can do it because for them, investing is a process. They do it day in, day out. But for an entrepreneur, raising capital is an event. See, I, I always tell my investors that I want capital for my business. I'm not into business of capital raising, right? I, I, I need capital for my business. I'm not in business of capital raising. So I look forward to you to give me the right advice and hence forge a long lasting relationships. And secondly, when we are talking about returns, I think it's a debate that we can continue to do it, continue to have. But uh, when we are talking about 26% return on 10 years basis is giving 10x to the investor. They deserve it for the risk they take. But for a win-win situation and for a very meaningful partnership, if they not only aim at maximizing the returns, there is something in between maximization and minimum returns is optimizing the return. That is what creates a win-win situation in the long run. That you talk about trust between investor and entrepreneur. How will this trust come from? Where will this trust come from? When I, I, when I, when as an investor, I go an entrepreneur, I tell that I want the maximum returns from this business, and hence I'm going to have this much haircut in valuation. I, uh, I often, and my brother joke, 
that this is not haircut, this is removal of hair. The <laughs> it, at this valuation. So, if you are talking about the trust, it has to have some foundation. And the foundation of trust is when we take care about each other's interest. And that is where the trust comes from. So this is my expectation from the investor that in order to create a very good ecosystem of entrepreneurs and investors and invest investors getting their optimum returns, the entrepreneurs getting the capital at the right time and in the right manner, they're getting the operational freedom because at the end of the day, it is the entrepreneur spirit which runs the businesses and capital is a, just an enabler, but a very important enabler. So this is how we uh, have done so far. As of now, we have wonderful relationships with our investors, all five sets, uh, uh, five rounds of investment, what we had. We have FMO, DG, and low capital sitting as uh, investors in our company. And whenever we meet, we don't talk about exit, but we talk about what are the new opportunities. And this is the function of, I reckon, this is the function of the understanding and the approach we had in capital raising. Uh, I would like to appreciate the effort of Nipam Shah and this uh, team for bringing us, bringing all of us together. Because I know lecturing a Gujarati entrepreneur is very difficult. So they say that I don't want to understand how I should do business from you. I know how to do the business. So I would like, I would not like to name that, but we had started something like training the entrepreneurs. And every time to bring them to the class was a big task. So this is a very good effort done by you and your team for bringing all of us together. And the advantage what you get from such forums is that you get the opportunity to learn from somebody's mistakes. See, what is experience after all? Experience is that I have done this, I was successful, take this as a motivation, I did this, I was not successful, take this as, the, take, take this as a warning. So this is how it helps you in your future uh, business endeavors. And I'm very happy to be uh, among you, uh, all of you here, and share my views on what we did on capital raising. Because this is a subject very close to my heart. Whenever I talk to any entrepreneur, I'm very keen that he remains in the driver's seat and runs the business. And his entrepreneur spirit keeps the business moving. So I'm, this is a subject very close to my heart and over these years. We have so far been in a position to manage our company accordingly. Thank you. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Kamlesh Gandhi, for the appreciation.